miraculous murder. This is the case of Judy Malinowski. Hello, and welcome back to The Shit Detectives. This is the case of Judy Malinowski and how she testified in her own murder trial. Trigger warnings, cancer treatment, addiction, and DV. If this isn't a topic you can listen to right now, make a quick exit out of here because your mental health is more important. Judy was born in Ohio. Her childhood was described as a happy one, as she said to absolutely doted on her brother and sister, regularly competing and winning beauty pageants and becoming homecoming queen. Sadly, as a young adult, her life was thrown into turmoil as she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. She managed to defeat it once, however in 2006 she was told that it had returned. With no other alternative, Judy opted to have a hysterectomy. Just to cover the background so that all of our listeners can understand what it is that she went through, here is an echo tangent covering the signs and symptoms of ovarian cancer and what a hysterectomy consists of and some of the side effects and risks of the procedure. So take it away, Echo. Ovarian cancer affects the ovaries and can affect anyone with ovaries. It mostly affects women over 50, but can occur much younger. The symptoms of ovarian cancer aren't always obvious and it's often diagnosed late. The main symptoms of ovarian cancer are as follows. The swollen tummy or feeling bloated, pain or tenderness in your tummy or the area between the hips, so the pelvis area. No appetite or feeling full quickly after eating, an urgent need to pee or needing to pee more often. Other symptoms of ovarian cancer can include indigestion, constipation or diarrhea, back pain, feeling tired all of the time, losing weight without trying, and bleeding from the vagina after the menopause. The risk of developing ovarian cancer increases with age, with more than half of all cases in the UK in women aged 65 and over, but anyone with ovaries can get ovarian cancer and I cannot stress that enough. A person may have a higher chance of getting ovarian cancer if they inherited a faulty gene such as the BRCA genes or those linked to Lynch syndrome, had breast cancer or bowel cancer, had radiotherapy treatment for a previous cancer, have endometriosis or diabetes, started their period at a young age and went through the menopause late, so over 55, or have not had a baby, because these things may mean you've released more eggs, also known as ovulating more, have never used any hormonal contraception such as the pill or an implant, or you're taking hormone replacement therapy known as HRT, are overweight, and if you smoke. To give a full scope of the difficulties faced by those that have ovarian cancer, I'll also discuss the main tests used to diagnose it. A blood test and scan are usually done first, but there are other tests that are often needed to diagnose ovarian cancer. For instance, a patient may have an ultrasound scan to see if there are any changes in the ovaries. This might be done using a scanning device which is the size of a finger and is inserted into the vagina. This is known as a transvaginal scan. Or the patient may have an external scan over their tummy area. This is referred to as an abdominal scan. Other tests that may be done include a CT scan, removing a small sample of cells or fluid from your ovaries. This is known as a needle biopsy. Looking at your ovaries using a camera on the end of a tube through a small cut in your tummy. This is known as a laparoscopy. Surgery to remove tissue or possibly the ovaries. This is a laparotomy. As for a hysterectomy, it is a surgical procedure to remove the womb. Following a hysterectomy, a woman is unable to fall pregnant. And regardless of age, a woman will not have a period. 
it is a major operation with a long recovery time and is only considered after less invasive treatments have been tried. Types of hysterectomy. There are various types of hysterectomy. The type you have depends on why the operation is needed and how much of the womb and surrounding reproductive systems can safely be left in place. The main types of hysterectomy are total hysterectomy. This is where the womb and the cervix, which is the neck of the womb, are removed. This is the most commonly performed operation. A subtotal hysterectomy. This is where the main body of the womb is removed, leaving the cervix in place. A total hysterectomy with bilateral salpingoophorectomy. This is where the womb, cervix, fallopian tubes and ovaries are removed. And radical hysterectomy. This is where the womb and surrounding tissues are removed, including the fallopian tubes, parts of the vagina, ovaries, lymph glands and fatty tissues. There are three ways to carry out a hysterectomy. It can be a laparoscopic hysterectomy, which is a form of keyhole surgery, where small incisions are made in the tummy and the womb is removed through a cut in the vagina. Um, and I will say it is actually quite fascinating to look at because they use a bag to place the womb into to remove it. A vaginal hysterectomy, this is where the womb is removed through a cut in the top of the vagina and an abdominal hysterectomy. This is where the womb is removed through a cut in the lower tummy. As with any surgery, hysterectomies can have complications such as heavy bleeding, infection, damage to the bowel or bladder and serious reactions to the general anaesthetic. Such serious reactions to general anaesthesia would include something called MH. I'm calling it by its acronym because I can't pronounce it to save my life. And this is where this is actually a potentially fatal, though very rare, um, reaction to anaesthetic. And what occurs is you're given the anaesthesia. It will start to cause your muscles to it causes them to spasm at such a rate that your body starts to heat up, which causes you to become hyperthermic, which is where your body is too hot. We do have ways of reversing it, but it is potentially fatal. It is life threatening. Um, we do check backgrounds for it. Um, there are genetic tests for this particular reaction to anesthesia, but it is just to show just how drastic and serious these reactions can be to general anesthesia. Following her operation, she was prescribed opioids and unfortunately became addicted to them. While the drug epidemic was running rampant in the US, even more unfortunate is that when her medical insurance ran out, she turned to the street and sought other drugs such as heroin. Judy was one of the lucky ones whose family rallied around her and were able to offer her support. And she seemed to be doing well. That was until she met and subsequently started dating Michael Slager. Now to tell you a bit about him and their relationship, over to you, Turtle. Thanks, Eka. According to a documentary on Paramount Plus that we will cover in more detail later, Judy's boyfriend Michael had a very long rap sheet, ranging from theft, stalking, all the way to child endangerment and domestic assault. However, apart from that, most of the articles are rightfully focusing on Judy. Judy's family have described him as a manipulator who manipulated his way into her life and into a relationship. Their relationship began when the pair met through social media and after their very first date the two were said to be inseparable. However, during their time together they would fight regularly. Throughout the duration of their relationship, Judy regularly spoke of her wish to be strong and break out from his overbearing and controlling influence. According to one article discussing the Paramount Plus documentary, she reached out to numerous parties including the local police for assistance. 
We'd like to pause here to put in an important note. There is nothing to suggest that the police didn't help her when she reached out. Sadly, the statistics in these types of relationships suggest that returning to the relationship even after receiving assistance is very likely. Thanks for making that clear, Rekka. At some point, Judy fell back into her addiction, a habit that Michael would use to his full advantage, using her habit as a method to control Judy, though he seemingly never used drugs himself. This all came to a head in August 2015. I'm now going to go over the malevolent murder. Whilst on her way to rehab on the 2nd of August, the two of them were engaged in another one of their blazing arguments, which is highly speculated to be about him not wanting her to go to rehab. When Judy threw a can at Michael, ATM footage shows him responding by dousing her in fuel, going to his car and fetching a lighter and setting her alight. Somebody else frantically called the emergency services when Michael attempted to pass it all off as a tragic accident, claiming that she had poured the gasoline down herself and then he had accidentally lit her on fire when he was helping her light a cigarette. When medical professionals arrived, they didn't expect Judy to survive the inferno that had already engulfed her body. And now, because these types of birds could happen to anyone and can be detrimental, here is some advice for what to do if you or somebody you know suffers from a burn injury after contacting either emergency services or a medical professional for advice. You know what to do, Echo. Thank you, Turtle. So, firstly, there are multiple different types of burns. And yes, sunburn is still a burn. You would not believe how many people think it isn't and they're classified depending on depth and severity. First degree, also known as superficial burns, affect only the epidermis or outer layer of the skin. The burn site is red, painful, dry, and with no blisters. Mild sunburn is an example of this. Long-term tissue damage is rare and usually involves an increase or decrease in the skin color. A second degree burn also known as a partial thickness burn. These types of burns involve the epidermis and part of the dermis layer of skin. The burn site appears red, blistered, and may be swollen and painful. A third degree burn, this is also known as a full thickness burn, destroys the epidermis and dermis. Third degree burns may also damage the underlying bone, muscles, and tendons. When bones, muscles, or tendons are also burned, this may be referred to as a fourth degree burn. The burn site appears white or charred. There is no feeling in the area since the nerve endings are destroyed. There are many types of burns caused by thermal, radiation, chemical, or electrical contact. Thermal burns, these burns are due to heat sources which raise the temperature of the skin and tissues and cause tissue cell death or charring. Hot metal, scaffolding, liquid, steam and flames when coming into contact with the skin can cause thermal burns. Radiation burns. These burns are due to prolonged exposure to ultraviolet rays of the sun or other sources of radiation such as x-ray. Chemical burns. These burns are due to strong acids, alkalis, detergents, or solvents coming into contact with the skin or eyes. And electrical burns. These burns are from electrical current, either alternating current, AC, or direct current, DC. According to the NHS website, if someone burns themselves, then these following steps of first aid should be applied. Immediately, get the person away from the heat source to stop the burning. Cool the burn with cool or lukewarm running water for 20 minutes. Don't use ice, iced water or any creams or grease substances such as butter. Though you can use burn gel. Um, that can be pretty good if you're in a pickle and can't get to water. Remove any clothing or jewellery that's near the burnt area of the skin, including baby's nappies. Don't move 
anything that's stuck to the skin. Make sure the person keeps warm by using a blanket, for example, but take care not to rub it against the burn area. Cover the burn by layering a layer of cling film over it. A clean plastic bag could also be used for burns on your hand. Use painkillers such as paracetamol or ibuprofen to treat any pain. If the face or eyes are burnt, sit up as much as possible rather than laying down, as this helps to reduce the swelling. And that is your first dose of first aid training provided to you for free by the shit detectives. Handing it back to you, Turtle. One of Judy's nurses said that they have an equation that is used to calculate the likelihood of survival. And in Judy's case, she was 31, with approximately 80 to 90% of her body being severely burnt, and that made her likelihood of dying at 110%. But what this equation didn't factor in was Judy's sheer determination for justice, which led to her defying the odds, if only temporarily. Which brings us to the miraculous testimony. While Judy was fighting for her life, the investigation was in full swing. Michael's account quickly fell apart as they gathered the footage from the ATM and eyewitnesses came forward, providing their accounts of what they saw. One witness even went so far as to say they felt that it was only their presence that made Michael reach for the fire extinguisher. There was just one key witness missing, and it was Judy. And she most certainly was going to make sure that her testimony would be heard. Over to Echo to tell us more. She was in a medically induced coma for several months to try and allow her body the opportunity to focus on healing itself without all the hustle and bustle of being alive and conscious. Police were waiting to hear whether or not Judy had passed on. As if she died, Michael would be charged with homicide. There was even sufficient evidence for a suggestion of the death penalty. Then, the totally unprecedented thing occurred. Judy came out of the coma. This allowed for something even more astonishing to happen. She went on record, footage showing her horse and struggling to talk as she gave her account and later testimony. Here's a snippet of her sharing her account in her own words. What happened as you uh, stood behind that speedway? Well, Mike came in a matter of no time at all around in his truck. He saw me and immediately slammed the truck into the park, got out, demanded that I got into the truck with him, called me all sorts of names. Uh, we argued for a good five to ten minutes, and then I threw my pop on him. You threw a pop on him? Yes. Uh, did you splash it on him or actually throw the cup at him? I threw the cup at him. Okay, and this cup was it? Uh, a hard plastic or paper or what was it made out of? I believe it was a styrofoam cup. Okay. Um, uh, did the drink get on him? Yes. What was his reaction to this? He was extremely upset. And what did he do? He ran around to the other side of his truck and he got his uh, of gasoline that he had cut the back of his truck. Uh, it was a really big a lot of gas. He ran around with me and started pouring gasoline, started up my head and worked his way down. Some got through my throat as he did that. That uh, burnt really bad. The gasoline in your throat burnt really bad? Yes. And uh, what, what happened as a result of having this gasoline poured on you? He then set me on fire. Well, let's slow down a little bit. Before that, uh, were you, did you remain standing, or were you standing when he poured the gasoline on you? No. When he poured the gasoline on you, were you standing? No. Go ahead and tell us what, uh, how you were when, when he poured the gasoline on you. I fell down and I was leaning on my front seat. 
holding myself with my right arm and hand. Okay. So did you fall down as a result of that burning sensation from the gasoline? No. Okay. What caused you to fall down? I fell down completely the rest of the way. But I originally had fell down because he had pushed me. I tripped when I was running from him. You can really hear the pain and suffering that she's going through when making the testimony. It's honestly so heartbreaking to hear. It really is. Back to what happened. The detective on the case stated how they had never seen such extensive injuries on a person who was still alive. They had to lean in to talk to her as she didn't have any ears and needed intense surgeries with repeated failed skin grafts and repeated carouts. In the meantime, Slaker was charged with aggravated arson and felony assault, to which he pled no contest, but only after news of Judy's video testimony, as he felt that it, quote, would only make the jury hate him, end quote. The judge sentenced him to the maximum penalty of 11 years. This devastated Judy and her family and led them to start a campaigning to increase the maximum sentence if someone were to be left permanently disfigured. Judy stated that her life, as well as the lives of everyone she knew, had been ruined, and that the law, as it stands, is not fair. The law was changed just a few months after Judy passed away. As Judy's condition worsened, the prosecution had an ace up their sleeve and requested of Judy that she record testimony for her inevitable murder trial, and she agreed. She would be the first person in the world to testify from beyond the grave. The prosecution had to do a lot of legwork to get it approved in court, using similar cases to suggest legal precedent. Rather heroically, although her condition was rapidly deteriorating, she lowered her pain medication to ensure her lucidity during the testimony, her body showing signs of intense pain, but all the same, she gave a powerful deposition. In the deposition in which she described the attack, she said, After I threw the drink at him during the fight, he ran around to the other side of his truck and grabbed cans of gasoline. He started to run around me and pour the gasoline, starting at my head and it went in my mouth and it burnt me as he worked his way down. As he reached for the lighter, he backed away, his eyes went black and I begged him, I said, please, I'll get in the truck, I'll go with you, but as he lit me on fire and walked back, I screamed and he did nothing. There was another revelation, that Michael wished to be present at the time of the recording. Fortunately, both judge and prosecution saw this for the intimidation tactic it was, and his request was denied. He may have thought that he could control the narrative if he was present at the time of the recording, but instead it creates a huge warning sign printed on his forehead that this man is an abusive psychopath. It really does. And you can guarantee those in prison with him will know all about it. Oh yeah, they definitely will. Anyway, here is Echo with the defence. The defence lawyer then cross-examined her and mentioned her drug usage, to which she held her own, replying honestly and mentioning how Slager was directly responsible for her getting re-hooked on multiple occasions. At one point, she even went as far as talking over the lawyer to inform them that he had previously threatened her life stating, it must be hard for you to understand, but you must. I was thrown onto the ground and burnt alive. 95% of me is burnt. It is hard for me to keep track of every horrible thing that happened in the relationship. On to the aftermath. Five months later, she recorded her deposition. Judy died at age 33. She asked that Slager not face the death penalty for his crimes 
instead asking that he receive a life sentence in the hopes that he find religion, God and forgiveness if he pled guilty. Her obituary described her as courageous and her 23 month battle for life a miraculous event as she has been able to seek justice. Flake was charged with homicide to which he pled guilty and was given a life sentence. Paramount Plus released a documentary called The Fire That Took Her. They cover details of the case and Judy's deposition, the obituary and the groundbreaking legal precedent for posthumous testimony. On to our thoughts and opinions. Firstly, I want to offer my sincere condolences to the family of Judy. Reading up on her and hearing how hard she fought for justice has been an absolute privilege to read about, although very sad that it happened at all. Warriors like Judy and her family are why I got into true crime, and telling their warrior story to the general public is why I decided to get into true crime podcasts and decided to take part in this one. The legal groundwork that this case will have set into motion is going to allow for so many more people to be able to find justice. Although I sincerely hope that her medical bill was taken care of, what a horrible thing to happen to the family with the legal battles and campaigning and the funeral costs and then a whoppy great medical bill all because some selfish little man didn't like not getting his way. In spite of everything, Judy has endeavoured to be the best mom to her kids even if that meant letting her family take the lead while she struggled in the throes of addiction. This case is both heartbreaking and inspiring to me, and it was an absolute honour to research it. Sharing stories like this with some information that could help people or even save lives are exactly why I'm involved in this podcast. What happened to Judy was absolutely tragic and no one deserves to go through such agony. But despite it all, she didn't just fight for justice for herself. She campaigned for others. And that, to me, is such an inspiration and a testament to who she was as a human being. She had 95% of her body burned. And still, she found the strength to campaign for others and get the law changed, as well as reduce her painkillers so that she would have the lucidity to testify. It honestly blows my mind. She was an incredible woman and that deserves to be remembered. As for Michael, all I can say is coercive control, DA and DV. I would give the full words, but YouTube doesn't like them. So the acronyms will have to do. I hope he rots, I really do. And that's about as much as I'm going to say on him. Because I want to focus on Judy. Thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to tune in next week where we will be back with another episode. In the meantime, make sure that you are following the Shit Detectives on social media as that is the place where we release teaser clips and mini-series that are going to be only available on that platform. Please don't forget about my mini-series in which I'll be reading the Brothers Grimm's Tales. And if you're not sure on what they are, you can tune in as we will have explained them to you in the first episode. Uh, Further to this, um, we are making the switch over from X to Threads. Okay, so see you on TikTok. Bye. Bye!